why do you only need two pallbearers at a Micronesian funeral? Why? Because the rubbish can only has two handles. You know we call him FSM. Stupid micros. What do you call a Micronesian with a toothbrush? A miracle! What do you call a, a Micronesian in a mansion? A thief. Yeah. How do you tell if the Micronesian in brought your house? Because they only stole the cookies. What do you call a truck full of Micronesians? A dump truck! <laughs> I was on the bus once, and on the bus you see the best and worst of people. It's, it's really interesting if you just ride the bus. Um, I was sitting in the back next to this local gentleman. He'd seen some Micronesians get on the bus and he was complaining about them, talking about how they have ugly gold teeth and wear these ugly clothes and they spit everywhere and get drunk. And I guess it was kind of hard for him to tell that I was Micronesian. And he was just going on this rant the whole time. And after he was done, I said, you know, we're not all that bad. <laughs> I go to school. I don't get drunk every weekend. I don't chew and spit all over the place. The whole thing was just very rude. And I was kind of sad to hear that. If people understand the kind of uh problems and the kind of lack of development that has plagued the islands for a long time under the United States and uh, that long history of relationship. I think people will better understand uh, the presence of Micronesians here. Micronesia was a major battleground for the U.S. and Japan during World War II. After the war, the United Nations placed several of these islands in the trust territory of the Pacific Islands. The United States administered this trust, taking responsibility for the economic, political, and social development of Micronesia with the goal of self-determination. The U.S. then proceeded to set off 67 open-air atomic and hydrogen bombs in the Marshall Islands. The power of these bombs far exceeded what was detonated at other nuclear test sites. One bomb yielding 10.4 megatons of explosive energy vaporized the island of Ujalab, leaving a crater deep enough to hold the 17-story building where the island had been. In 12 years of nuclear testing, the United States detonated the equivalent of 7,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs in the Marshall Islands. And what about the people? They were not warned of the dangers of these tests and allowed their children to play in the radioactive ash that covered their islands. Some were relocated, left to starve on previously uninhabited islands with inadequate food and water supply. They suffered severe vomiting and diarrhea. Their hair began to fall out. Their skin burned. They developed radiogenic cancers and the women suffered stillbirths. Babies were born with severe deformities, some without bones, others with unusual growths. In 1986, the United States entered into the Compact of Free Association with the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Republic of Palau, collectively known as the Kofa Nations. The U.S. assumed control over the foreign affairs, airspace, and waters of the Kofa Nations. In return, the U.S. was charged with addressing past, present, and future consequences of its nuclear testing in the region. The U.S. promised to promote the economic development of the Kofa nations so they could become self-sufficient. Additionally, citizens of the Kofa nations were afforded entry into the U.S. for medical treatment, education, and employment. Promised within that compact were both monetary and land um, I would call them reparations, to try to repair some of that harm from before. But to this day, the United States has resisted actually paying even a fraction of um, what was owed to them, what was determined to be owed to them. Having to look at that whole history and in the way that the U.S. still retains a lot of political control over the region, even if they're independent nations, I think there is something really unique about that relationship. The Kofa nations remain poverty-stricken and dependent on the U.S. for aid. 
the people continue to suffer from a high rate of radiogenic diseases as well as heart disease, diabetes, and obesity results of the change in diet and lifestyle forced upon them by the nuclear testing and military operations on their islands. We have still radiation in our waters, air, and ground, which we eat and drink from. People are really, really, um, you know, having sickness that they don't have before. And so the hospital that we have on our islands is not compatible enough to meet the need of the communities. We have a lot of people suffering from diabetes. At the same time, we don't have the kind of health infrastructure in our island to take care of the diabetic, the diabetic, um, diabetic patients. There is not one single dialysis machine back home. Even if we were to send them dialysis machines, you need to have electricity, you need to have clean water, both of which they probably don't have at their medical facilities. So as a result, you see people that have to come over here, you know, to the islands to seek, you know, treatment for diabetes. These guys have chronic illnesses. I mean, when you have diabetes, it's not like, oh, here, take a pill and get out of here, right? It's, you're gonna to go to dialysis three times a week for the rest of your life. So if you don't have a dialysis system set up in Marshall Islands, you, you have no choice to go back, you're stuck. Under the Compact of Free Association, Kofa migrants were promised medical services, which were provided by the state of Hawaii. However, in 2009, Governor Linda Lingle introduced a new health plan, Basic Health Hawaii, which significantly reduced benefits for Kofa migrants. Nothing wrong with the Basic Health Hawaii. It's good for someone who is healthy, someone who, who, who is not sick and didn't come out here for that purpose alone. Our community is sick. Our community came here because there, there is just no medical uh, assistant back home. The letter from DHS at the time when they first tried to cut Micronesians from Medicaid benefits, the letter itself actually said the economy, you know, there's a downturn in the economy and therefore we're cutting you from this benefit. So they became this target based, this kind of economic sacrifice. Our father is a diabetic uh, patient. If we had gone into the basic health Hawaii, he will lose a lot of the services that he get. We would have to cough up um, more than 2,000 something just for one dialysis alone. And so we can't afford that. And if it, it had gone through, my father said alone that he said, I have to prepare for my funeral if this come true. And for me, that's very, it's a personal fight because I don't want to see my father die. In 2010, the federal court ruled that Basic Health Hawaii violated the 14th Amendment and reinstated benefits for Kofa migrants. Unfortunately, during the time Basic Health Hawaii was in effect, many of the Micronesians' treatments were altered and the results were devastating. Some people actually died from that. You know, I know people who are actually died and I know relatives who told me that some, uh, some of our relatives you know, died as a result of this. Their, their situation deteriorated because dialysis, you have to do it on a regular basis. And if you don't do it on a regular basis, then it puts a strain on your system. Then, and some people actually passed away because of that. In spite of the controversy regarding their medical benefits and the fact that Kofa migrants are not eligible to receive welfare benefits, the general public continues to believe that Micronesians are draining the resources of the state. What is behind this anti-Micronesian sentiment? And how is the discrimination taking shape? It might have something to do with the, the last five years or so of the economy, that maybe because the economy has been so bad, they also become this convenient scapegoat. And that certainly happened um, during the Basic Health Hawaii struggle. Because there's been uh, a lot of discussion in the media about the problems of Micronesians in Hawaii, people feel comfortable in saying horrible racist things about them that they wouldn't even consider saying about other racial 
groups, even minority groups. And this racist rhetoric or even masked rhetoric around an ethnic group can be so damaging. <clears throat> and it can lead to devastating policies and it can lead to people's lives being really turned upside down. Micronesians and Marshallese have been scapegoated and targeted so that it translates into the way they're treated on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of uh, women in the community who are professionals, they will tell me how differently they're treated when they wear their chickies skirt or their chickies dress, something that's identifiably Micronesian. We were doing this class and we would go spend some time with these kids at, in Waianae that were in like low-income housing and we'd spend time, and the kid I was working with was Chukis, and he would tell me all this stuff that the other kids would tease him about. You know, it's just like stupid Micronesian, where you go teeth at, how come your mom wears curtains and stuff like that. And it just made me sad because this kid, he, he was really talented in photography, and he had this really bright future, but he had this big problem with these kids making fun of him like that, and it was just like kind of getting in the way of all that potential, you know. So what is the significance of this issue to the Japanese American Citizens League and the community in general? We're all immigrants. All of us had, at a certain point, our ancestors come over to seek a better life here. It, it's really important for Japanese Americans and the day sale in particular to to look at this in a historical context. There was a time here in Hawaii when uh, with the English Standard School System and uh, where there, there was a real question, could, could Japanese children learn, learn English? We were seen as being the other, as being disloyal, uh, sneaky, all, all the stereotypes. Now it really goes to our responsibility to look at how um, others are treated and we're, we really are looking at our responsibility and obligations as a civil rights organization. As a society, we need to check ourselves sometimes. We're so quick to be anti-immigrant, but we forget that this place is built on immigration. This whole idea of the United States of America experience is the history of immigration. My hopes for the future is, is very bright, actually, and because we, we don't give up. I hope that the good apples, you know, are more seen, because I feel like there are, you know, Every group has a bunch of people that, you know, aren't exactly the best example of them. And I just feel like maybe that's the side of us that gets seen the most. I'm really hoping that they will give us chances to, to you know, learn and to even prove that we are good community members and that we do contribute to the richness of this community. It really is about doing the, the right thing and not just for ourselves, but because of the things that we believe in. That's my big hope is that um, we look past beyond these like racial, cultural things. Just like we're all one group here, let's work together and make this place better for everyone.